turn into Danby too quick now, <laughs> and I'm going to introduce Rachel Brown. Um, or maybe Matthew wants to turn into Danby. <laughs> But this is not, these are not my words, so I should say that to give Dan proper credit. The poet Donald Rebell suggests that poetry is always ahead of the poem. I thought much about this riddling idea. A poem delays in words just long enough, and by the gift of delay, each poem offers an imperfect window into the larger world of, the, of art as a whole. In some sense, more and less than real, any given poem worthy of the name speaks as best it can, not only for itself, but of this other realm that can be spoken of in no other way. Putting into words that art, though depending on language for its daily life, shrugs them off to protect in wondrous silence its deeper vitality. So poetry becomes a lesson in forms of devoted betrayal. In the years I've taught poetry, I've seldom seen a poet gain in such leaps and bounds the ability to participate in that devotion as Rachel Brown. In these scant three years, Rachel has done something many poets never begin. She arrived here with talent and gift all in place, writing poems of precision and sentiment. Now she writes poems that risk breaking those talents and gifts in order to ask questions more profound, and the profundity of them is tied deeply to betrayal, not as a human act, but betrayal as an inevitable, even loving experience of heart and mind and world. Her concern is nostalgia in the oldest sense. She suffers that wound of home. Her poems revolve around family, of mothers and fathers, of home as the built thing that protects one from the harsh realities of the world. The other mother nature is beautiful, yes, and Rachel knows how to appreciate her splendor. She also knows that the world is the very thing family offers refuge and protection from. Her poems, almost each of them, act as a kind of spiritual transom, marking the threshold between inner and outer, window and door, object through which one can look at the world without entering it, and space through which one must enter the world itself, and in doing so, leave what had been, ha leave what had been home behind. So begins the nostalgic wound. Walking through the door, just that makes us suffer it. Suddenly, we share a life of lyric complications. Growing up, we are beyond the home, which is our source of it, but not in it, just as any given word is and is not the thing it names. Rachel's thesis is, at some most basic level, an extraordinary account of this most existential and philosophical moment. Growing up in a house only so as to walk out of it, only so as to want to return and to do so, but one can never wholly return. Such is the nature of devoted betrayal, as Rachel's poems let us know. There is another meaning to nostalgia. In botany, it refers to what happens when a plant that, when moved from native ground to another, does not thrive, but dies. That plant has died in nostalgia. Perhaps the work of a poet, to be reductive, no doubt, is to replant oneself in the ground of one's first rooting. Such work involves discovering absences and not only discovering them, but creating them oneself. Rachel's poems are riddled with such absences, graveyards, gold mines. And this brings me to one final hope that Rachel's poems offer me as a devoted reader of them, that a poet doesn't try to fill absence, but teaches us how to value it, and in valuing it, widen its scope, deepen its meaning, and in the most unexpected way, offer us a home where none could seem to be at all, in that nothing, that is poetry's dear, aimless realm. Please help me in welcoming Rachel Lee Brown. Thank you, Sasha, and to Dan from afar. <clears throat> I want to begin tonight with my thank yous because there are so many people who have had an extraordinary impact on me and my work at my time at CSU and who deserve all the gratitude in the world and many more words than I can share in one evening. I'd first like to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm excited to share this reading with you and it means so much to have all of you here. I want to thank Marnie, Sheila, and Sue Russell for all they do to help our lives run smoothly and keep us on track. Thanks to the composition department and the creative writing department for giving me an opportunity to teach as a GTA. Thanks especially to Tom, Nancy, and Emily for all of their advice and support. 
Thanks to my CO150 students, past and present, who are here tonight. Love you guys. You've made me, it's been a pleasure to work with you, and you've helped me become a much better teacher. Many thanks to my poetry workshop mates for their careful attention to my work over the years, especially fellow third years, Kaylin and Lincoln, who I have the honor of reading with tonight. It's been a delight learning with and alongside you. Many thanks to Mary, Kristen, Gracie, Drew, and Matt, who are all exceptional people and poets. I very much enjoy taking workshop with you, and I know you're going to have fantastic third years. Special thanks to Mary for all the work you've done to make tonight happen and be wonderful, and thank you so much for our friendship. Best of luck as well to Abby, Katie, and Melissa as you continue at CSU, and thank you for the help you're lending me tonight. Thanks to Dr. Fiji, whose History of the U.S. West class I enjoyed, and who generously offered to become one of my thesis committee members. Many thanks to Stephanie Gershwind. I've learned so much from you in a, such a short amount of time. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your caring with all of us. Thanks to Matthew for always pushing me to explore my poetical horizons. Thanks to Sasha for standing in for Dan tonight and for helping me always expand my poetry and connect my poems. Thanks to Dan, whose gentle spirit and careful eye have helped me find deeper meaning and musicality in my poetry, who has helped me develop my thesis as my advisor. Many thanks to E.J. Levy, who is kind, gracious, generous, and encouraging of all of her students. Thank you for making us better writers and for being such a positive presence. Many, many thanks to my nonfiction workshop mates, Sam, Tara, Whitney, Neely, and Artemis, with whom I shared a year of writing and to Sue, and Natalia, Christine, Alam, John, Sarah, Jayla, and Jessica, who have all made this semester special. Thank you for all of your wonderful feedback and support. I'm definitely going to this workshop next year. You've made me feel at home. Thanks to Kristen Marie and Anitra, with whom I've shared many cups of coffee and wonderful conversations. Thank you for your friendship and your encouragement. Thank you to Hannah and her family, Scout, Willa, and Carson, for being such a light and lovely presence in my life. I always cherish our time together and look forward to our next meeting. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Many thanks to Tirtha, who is one of the sincerest, gentlest, and most considerate people I've ever met, a beautiful po poet and a very special friend I hold dear to my heart. Thank you to my chocolate Labrador baby, <laughs> who, if you know me, you know I love her. She's been curled up by my side or at my feet for every single word of my thesis, and she's brought so much warmth and joy to my life. I would like to thank the Martinez family, Nicole, Leroy, Sai, and Ari, who I met by happy chance when I moved next door, coming to Fort Collins, and have since become a family away from family. Words cannot express how grateful I am for your thoughtfulness and our friendship. Many heartfelt thanks to Ellen Brinks, with whom I've taken two literature classes and served as a GTA while at CSU. The first class I took with Ellen was an English literature survey to fulfill one of my MFA course requirements, and I was so touched by her poise, kindness, enthusiasm, and intelligence that I knew I had to take more classes with her, and I'm very honored to now count her not just as an amazing professor, but as a very dear friend. Thank you for everything, Ellen. You've made such a difference in my life. Friends sometimes come into your life like sunshine, so cherished that it doesn't matter how or when you met or what you first talked about or why. It simply feels like you've always been friends. Jennifer Lawson is this friend, and she has driven up to Fort Collins to be here tonight. Thank you, Jennifer, for all of the laughter and good times you've shared and for simply being the incredible person that you are. I'm so lucky to have you in my life. Thank you, Rachel. And I saved them for last because they're first in my heart. But I would like to thank my family. Sorry, <laughs> I'm really excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, Dina, my dad, Kevin, and my younger sisters, Jennifer and Angela, who have always supported me and shown me so much love. When I was a girl, my mom and dad would each take one of my hands and lift me into the air as we walked through our fields together. So it felt like we were fine. And even though I've gotten a little too big for that now, <laughs> they're always there and mean the world to me. I love you all so, so much. And my mom, who is here tonight, has flown twice since I was born, and both times have been to come to visit me in Fort Collins. Thank you for believing in me, Mom, for always letting me know how much you love me, 
and for being more wonderful than words can say. You're my best friend, and I'm so thankful to share this evening with you. I dedicate my reading to you, Mom. So, I'm going to stop crying. <laughs> and read selections from my thesis, pulled chronologically. My first poem tonight is the first poem in my thesis, which I've titled, Threshold. Front door for mom who gave me these words. Hold on, let me find a clock that works. Reflection. I know her waking up in this town, street light washing out. I am always surprised by how lonely I know this woman like air knits the wounds halves faster, like red to brown, apples in fall, rot like. I forgot blossoming until now. I ought to love without scar, like I must love the woman who looks like. I look back, always surprised at the eyes. I meet like mine, like I am a pupil, tongue, and a drum, and bone to her. Like I've heard her cry through bone, through ear, as well as bone. Transplant. Catfish dry on fence posts along the road to the church of white steepled daisies in the ditch <coughs> reduced by sun to skulls. Bare and thirsting, I bury my fingers among the white roots. You rise from stocks. You rise from the cracking white ghost of a puddle in the road and settle there again when I'm past, blinking in your own way, heedless of dust and soul. I swear I will tend your flowers well, take with me their native dirt for growing, revive and leave you these holes by the church road to emerge and drift into anticipating some familiar departed thing. Careful, I only hold the aisle mouth, black mirrored eye spot, airy earthen soul with wide cradled palms. <coughs> Memento. What light do I draw as I lie on this fresh-cut lawn and watch lines of ants track through blades, tickle my ankle? Do I not move? Wind knocks pears from the tree that bows with yellowing fruit. Come worm, come fly. Here is one for you on the ground. Soul. A white breasted nuthatch lies among petals. I shut my living room window, noon driving into and passing through my pain. Snow Moon for Gracie, who told me to take the nuke out of the poem, and I did and it became a much better poem. <laughs> Snow Moon. I plaster the hole in my white flowered parlor wall and toss a pipe and stove in the dump along my neighbor's fence row with a pickup cab, console, radio, and photo albums of crinkled up plastic children blowing out candles. You bathe everything I leave in the cold, everything lit clean, every last scrap of me silently brimming. 
full now, full again, when emptied and most new. Mo, I've looked for you in corners since I returned. You might have left a little dust of your slouch self, the sock you cast off when thistles touched your ankle, your lips on the lip of a juice glass, the butter and eggs we picked for each other, pinching their slight mouths like snapdragons of childhood gardens. We filled our cups with water, cut stems to size, satisfied our arrangement. But now I've exhausted my search. Not even the webs and the rafters hold you. I wrap myself against dusk. Moths worry my little flame. I curl into deep cushions waiting for this room without you to feel like a room again, pumping my blood blue before infusing it red at the heart. Ayo, Ma. We pass between in the lonely deep we call black because we have no name for the shades of one body. I draw your red and purple, yellow, orange, blue. You blur white when I turn pages, like vapor and ice, like falling, like stone, like stars burned up before impact. Brilliant, gone so soon. We wish on them anyway, and continue our unfelt turning, because we are so small, and so old to greater cores than our own, like that of the sun. Venus, let me make a pupil of this page and hold it away for myself until you drift across monochrome. I won't project your fire. You cannot look me in the face. Yarrow ear. Listen until my whistle no longer is lips and air from lungs, but Gus, who are you? Where are you going? <coughs> I am like you. And like you, still a wound. Little blue stem, I would have followed you into needling boughs, but clouds drew near, and I heard thunder in my heart. Linnaeus, for dad. I pick fragments of china plates and green, blue, and see-through bottles from soil. Nothing I can assemble whole. This writing spider, Animalia, <coughs> Arthropoda, Arachnida, Araniae, Aranidae, Aragio, Ah, Arantia, will consume tonight her web's middle and weave it again tomorrow. Dew wets her silk and the tips of leaves, fingers. I startle a garter snake, basking amid string beans dangling, and I think of the trash I burned, setting fire to field, and I think of the warren filled with kits and a black snake's coils, P. obsoletus, I counted, later, the beads of its body. I disturb fresh webs. I draw their silk from my mouth. Accidents. Muse. 
Have I disturbed you again? Soft to my own ear, I approach. Only night, wind unsettling the curtains, hung over windows, cracked and glancing across my face, carrying your syllable from a distant ridge to my rapt ears. for my sisters. The monarchs have returned to the late purpling clover of the uncut field, not the boughs of the oak that could look like autumn again if monarchs settled on its high naked limbs and altogether closed their wings. Wind girls, we left artifacts the cow skull we painted blue, and its blue teeth we scattered in the back pasture, our own hands and names, nouns we wished of the old children. We found <coughs> their prints. Two hands in the chicken coo floor, a pop bottle beneath the hickory tree with a worn out tractor seat nailed to the bowl of its first strong branch. That hickory fell. Even you outgrew my palms. I remember well our growing things, rhubarb leaves and hickory nuts and tough-shelled walnuts, the tall stalks of sweet corn any storm blew over, the red and black raspberry thorns. And I remember pumpkin seeds that never sprouted, the barren mounds we watered August when our yard dried to dust and the creek didn't flow under our bridge for months before or after and fish were only husks on the banks. No monarchs that year. But I have returned to this late October and monarchs drift from purple head to head as if they were thoughts I came back to gather. But I have reached through every pumpkin rind, and in the orchard all the pears are flies. I remember us in quiet light, the holes we dug for seeds and doves, how, when very young, Lightning struck our oak to its roots, and the night, rushing to itself, shook every pane. You crawled into my bed and whispered, afraid? But I had heard almost nothing. Only you and the sheets you pulled back. So I answered, yes, but only of Hallow for home. I cannot distinguish your warmth from my own, or my shadow from the shadow of our rot soft oak. Rend around a heart like so. I brought water to our lamb with the torn out throat. Our shepherd died, stretched beside the wood stove. Rooted in grave, the sapling grows. I have shared with you a poem. I hope that you all will be able to read it with me. <laughs> Catechism. I will read the questions. And it would mean the world to me if you could read the italicized replies. Catechism. What stirred last night? You tangled your sheets. The reeds in your pot took root. Did you hear anything? Your little brass pot stopped at two. Raindrops made craters of the earth. I'm restive for what? Owls make off with the mice they find. Thunderstorms favor neither silence nor daylight. 
and seasons? Only change as earth tilting allows, and every flower takes its turn, late awake. How do I figure? The dirt is soft for you, bury your seeds. How deeply must I sow? Day until earthworms divide, their forward is also their back. How ought I cut my rows? Stop looking behind. You might not fall apart for a while. What have you marked? Stops must stand tall on their own. Webs droop between your rake and hoe. What hurts? You tear off from socks, cut odds from vines. Consume what you will grow again next year. Will I rest? Easier. Set your hands to earth. It will rain once more. Bone house. <coughs> I sit, drifting, silent a little longer, counting each visible breath. Which stars have already passed? Light like this, the first I see outlasts us, each wink colder, older, Leo, Orion. Leonids scatter, scatter, fragments, I wisp, oh, wisp, oh, of November, ember, oh, look, look around, each spare, unpredictable spark. Muse. I walk along wild plum blossoms you whisper accidental snow. Jack in the pulpit. I kneel, a katydid leaves its shell, a niche, and the white petals I trod upon still unfurl. Thank you.